Amen. Amen. Can you hear Sidney Portier when I say that? Old movie reference. Thank you, worship team, uh, for reminding us of the greatness of God, the power of his name, his attributes. Check, check. Everything's still good. Everybody good? Are we on, Daniel? Or... Welcome to the Foundry Church. We are in the midst of our, our summer series, but every opportunity is uh, to preach God's word is, is a chance to see God move. Uh, I have had a chance to speak at some big uh, places over the last couple weeks and, and also some very small men's breakfast last week. They were apologetic. Uh, only 22 men showed up on a Saturday morning for some breakfast. I thought, wow, 22 men on a Saturday morning in the summer? And they were hungry. They were hungry for breakfast. They were hungry for God. They asked great questions. And as everywhere I go, I know that people are hurting. People are hurting. And the conversations after I got to do my little combination of comedy, testimony, and presenting a principle from God's Word, there's always that one, in this case there were three, that wanted to talk afterwards. Meet me at the car. Help me unload load stuff back into the car. And I went, you got a minute before you leave? and then share some struggle they're going through. A deep personal struggle, a marital struggle, a, a question that they've been wrestling with for years. That, uh, it's, it's just amazing, because I always pray, Lord, wherever I am, there's somebody here that needs what I have, but today, it's a little different. Uh, I think everybody needs what I'm gonna share this morning. It is the secret to revival, it's the core to growing in our faith, it is one of the foundational things that Jesus impressed on his disciples. In fact, uh, it's one of the few questions the disciples asked of Jesus, who after had seen him now for over a year or two in their ministry, said, Lord, teach us to pray. Assumed, like you do, this going out by yourself, what spending time together, who at the last day of his earthly ministry, Challenge them, said, could you not even spend an hour? An hour? Five minutes for most of us, besides bless mommy, bless daddy, and bless our country, whatever we pray for. What, what do we pray? How do we pray? How do we make it more powerful? So, uh, is my PowerPoint popping up back there somehow? Is it, do, I need to, do I need to click? I see a neat picture of a Bible. There we go. Are your prayers on target? Now, my wife picked the PowerPoint this week because it has flooring on it, because I was trying to put flooring down in my daughter's apartment, and uh, that will move you to prayer. <laughs> that The snap and click flooring, I found means snap and break. It just, I went through eight pieces that could not get it going, and I was praying for wisdom on that. So it's like, wow, so there's prayers that we pray when we're desperate. There's all kinds of prayers in the Bible. We're going to explore that later on in the summer, maybe into the fall, the kinds of prayers, the power of prayer. There's so many different things. I really tried to limit my focus today on what makes prayer powerful. How do we move from that, now I lay me down to sleep, you know, the simple childish prayers, and the blessed mommies too, to prayers that move mountains, prayers that, that, that break strongholds, prayers that the, the singer in the opening video, what's her name, Katie Nicole, is that Katie? Yeah. Yeah, my goodness, what a powerful song. In Jesus' name, what does that mean? Where's the power? So I was thinking of that in the BB gun. We had Josiah and Michaela with us for a couple days last week, back from their mission trip. And then I think Josiah was going off to Japan, and uh, Michaela is coming back Tuesday from Alaska. So our, I, I love that. But uh, Josiah was, I don't know how we even saw our BB gun, but he, he said, oh, can I play with that? So we went outside, set up the picnic table with a tarp behind it, put out some targets, and man, he was out there, and he was laying down, and he was up in things, and he was trying to propose his... When I grew up, we had the simple, the simple Sears BB gun. My neighbors had the pump action daisy. And, and yeah, we shot each other. My, my little BB gun, I could shoot you, bink, bear, nothing. Three pumps on that thing, it was like a wasp sting. And if he pumped it up 10 times and you really had to get that last pin, that thing would go through a brick. I mean, it was powerful. So how do we go? How do, how do we take some simple prayers? You know, we got a call last night, 11 o'clock, just those, and uh, one of the boys in our old youth group, his dad was having a stroke. 
went to the hospital and was still having a stroke while in the hospital in front of the doctors. Gordon, could you pray for my dad? And, and shared and getting updates and he's, he's resting in ICU now down in Philadelphia and getting an update. What do you pray in those times? And how do you move from those prayers? So the, the BB gun had some significance and multiplying power. They always advertise stuff today, right, as maximum strength. Maximum strength. Best over-the-counter you can get, right? We always want maximum strength, whether it's an itch cream or a medicine, and we always do more than whatever it says. You know, just take two every four hours. That's suggested minimum, right? It's like, we never, we never do. We want maximum strength. We want instant relief. We want power and answers today. And yet when we pray in most churches, there's very little passion. There's very little effectiveness. There's very little expectancy that what we're going to pray for is going to happen. And, and there's a problem there. Because the verse that we cling to in the book of James says, the effectual, does that describe your prayer? Fervent, does that describe your prayer? The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous, ooh, does that describe us? Amen. <laughs> availeth much, accomplishes much. We should be seeing results left and right from our prayers. And if you're looking at the right places and you're connected to the right places, people, you are seeing some neat stuff. There are things happening in this country and around the world in answer to prayer more than anything I've seen in my 40 years as a believer. So we think about prayers. And, and when I was here a few weeks ago at the, uh, at the AA uh, group that meets here with them, they have the serenity system yeah this is a serenity prayer and uh, i mean just think about this as a prayer they said it together the long version this is the long version god grant me the serenity to accept the things i cannot change the courage to change the things i can and the wisdom to know the difference that's usually all that people quote but living one day at a time enjoying one moment at a time accepting hardship as a pathway to peace Taking, as Jesus did, the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it. Trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will. Oh, man, there's a sermon right there. So that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. That's a good prayer. That's a really good prayer. A lot of important requests, a lot of humble needs, a lot of recognition of what our goals are. There's a lot of principles. And, uh, you know, we, we hear, and I saw this posted on Facebook this week, the prayer of St. Francis, or the prayer of peace, as it's often called, which I found out was written 700 years after St. Francis died. <laughs> How did it become the prayer of St. Francis? <laughs> That's some real power there. If a guy could get a prayer named after him. And I know the font is a little, uh, that was pointed out to me, a little hard to read. But, but, but think about this. Is this like a prayer? Do you ever pray this? Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. How would we say that today? Lord, use me. Use me. Do you ever pray that? Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Ooh, there's a good one. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O oh, divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console. To be understood as to understand. To be loved as to love. For it is in going and giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Man, that's some good stuff right there. So... One of my favorite writers, history, people over the last 400 years is Charles Finney. I'm going to guess most of you have not read the lectures on spiritual revival or his biography, but uh, probably of the three top people led more people to Jesus in the last 500 years, few people. He was a brilliant lawyer who, who through deduction and argument and logic uh, came to faith with an amazing Apostle Paul type uh, experience and then began going to church and sharing with this brilliant legal mind and after several months of attending this church they said mr finney how can we pray for you and he said I i'm not sure i want you to pray for me 
I've been watching you pray for three months, and with all the prayers you prayed, there shouldn't be a demon left in this town. There shouldn't be a, a sick person going. There shouldn't be, there shouldn't be. But you don't pray as if thing, anything's going to happen. You just tell God a list of things. There's no faith. There's no answers, no results. Why would I ask you to pray for me? And, and that he had that kind of personality. <laughs> the gift of confrontation and, and, and identifying a problem. And uh, he began to research and found that they were well-meaning, they were good intention. they simply didn't know how to pray. What to pray for is one thing, knowing who we pray to, we're going to get into that more in our series as it unfolds, that we are approaching this God of wonders beyond this galaxy, the creator of all things. There is nothing too hard for him. We need that as a foundational truth. But he started to establish some principles and said, you, you need to expect that God is going to answer what you're asking for. So that implies you're asking for the right things. That's a whole sermon in itself when you pray in Jesus' name. Or are you asking for things that Jesus would ask for? We've talked about that before. I have a neat Facebook thing on that. But that was an interesting quote by Finney. It's like, no, how many times? I ask people all the time, how can I pray for you? And I... I've never had anybody turn me down. I don't think I can't think of one time. Even people at my high school reunion, people to I mean, you know, send me your good vibes, give me some positive thoughts. People post that kind of stuff on Facebook all the time. Hey, my husband, my son is going through a tough time. Get send out your good thoughts. No, I'm not gonna. I always put I'm praying in Jesus' name. You want prayer? Let's pray. But it's a battle, it's a weapon, and the weapons of our warfare are divinely powerful. For the tearing down of strongholds. That's one aspect of prayer. and um, So that's important. So the lack of faith is one of the real problems. We really don't understand or know how to pray or who we're praying to. The other simple principle, just if you're not seeing answers in your prayer, it comes from Psalm 66. And in fact, I'm already out of order, so I'm going to go here. I'll, I'll read the verse for you. If I have regarded iniquity or cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not hear me. The Lord doesn't listen. If you're living in sin and holding on to sin and not submitting to God, the Lord will not hear you. Now, he hears all things, but he's not listening. You know the difference, right? But God has surely listened and heard my voice in prayer. Praise be to God who has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love from me. So if there's a little offense in your life, if there's stuff you're holding on to, it, there's no markers on the phone. There's no reception. God doesn't have to answer your call if you're not in obedience in dealing with things in your life. That's a big problem. I, the Titanic was on last night. I, it, it just, I, I studied and read a little bit more on that. And, of course, the news the last couple of weeks where people got in that submersible thing and, and went through that implosion thing. But yeah, most people don't know this, that when the Titanic was going down, they were sending out their distress call and uh, there was a ship just less than 20 miles away. The, the Carpathia, which was way out there, four hours away, got the signal. But the California, the boat California, was less than 20 miles away. And earlier that night, the director, uh, the radio operator, I believe his name was Cyrus, he um, was sending warnings to the Titanic, said, we are stopped for the night. There's too many icebergs in this area. And his, he was radioing. The radio guy on the Titanic said, we're very busy. We've got a party going on. Just shut up. Because he kept sending warning after warning. And, and the radio operator on the Titanic said, shut up, shut up, shut up. We're busy. Got the transcript. And the guy on the California was miffed. And he said, well, I will shut up. And he turned off his radio. He reported to his captain. And he went to bed. And over the next hour, when the distress started to go out, the radio was silent. They have different estimates on how many more people could have been saved if that boat just minutes away would have just come over with the extra lifeboats and extra things. Uh, it's just one little area of offense that broke off communication that led to destruction. So a simple warning for all of us is stay right with God. One of the prayers God always answers, and I have a whole sermon on that. I, we just can't get into it tonight, but there's a book out called Ten Prayers God Always Says Yes To. I like that. I want to hear yeses. And one of the prayers is, Lord, show me if there's anything I need to deal with. 
Search me, O oh God, know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thought. Is there someone I need to get right with? Is there something I need to confess? That simple prayer, boy, that gets you four bars. God prays attention. I, I'm reading through the Bible again. They were very impressed with this last week. When I said I'm reading through the how many times have you read through the Bible? Well, when I was a first pastor, I remember being at Sandy Cove Bible Conference, and they asked everybody to stand up and said, how many of you have ever read through the Bible at least once? Stay standing. If you haven't, sit down. Over half the group sat down. Pastors. And then they said, how many have read it through more than once? And, and there was like four of us standing up. And, and I thought, wow, what a simple challenge. 13 minutes for an average reader, 13 minutes just to read through. I'm in the middle of Ezra today. Ezra chapter 8 was my reading today. And in chapter 8, Ezra called the nation to prayer and fasting. How timely is that on a Sunday morning when we're talking about prayer and fasting? I love that. I love that. So we read through the scriptures and there's things in there. So, here we go. So I have, I have lots of quotes. I have lots of quotes. One of my favorites is from a missionary down in Florida, Angie Massey. He said, on your knees, the devil flees. He used to have that on, on his hat. And prayer crumbles the very bastion, every bastion of darkness. Prayer demolishes every fortress of hell. Prayer is the all-conquering, invincible weapon of the army of God by Wesley DeWall, one of the most prolific writers in the, in the areas of revival. I love quotes on prayer. I love, uh, I did a little fuzzy on this, but E.M. Bounds. I have at least seven books, including the complete volume of E.M. Bounds on prayer. Look, God shapes the world by prayer. Prayers are deathless. The lips that other them may be closed to death, the heart that felt them may be ceased to beat. But the prayers live before God, and God's heart is set on them. And prayers outlive the lives of those who utter them. They outlive a generation, outlive an age. They outlive a world. There is a whole movement going on right now called Redigging the Wells. Did you know this? Where people are going to places where revival took place. Cain's River, Hebrides, Ashbury, out in Azusa Street. And they're praying the same prayers that people prayed in revivals. Redigging the wells, praying prayers of the past. And I love that idea that God can re resurrect. And somehow I can piggyback on prayers of my parents and grandparents and spiritual leaders in the past. My prayers can piggyback on them and have impact. That's an amazing thought. George Miller, faith does not operate in the realm of the possible. There is no glory for God in that which is humanly possible. Faith begins where man's power ends. So I love these stories. When we work, we work. But when we pray, God works. So there's some simple prayers. And it's going to lead to a couple of, of my favorite stories. Just because I want this to be inspiring to you. I want to encourage you that prayer is making a difference. So when we think of George Miller... Uh, how many know George Miller? No, okay, I'm, I'm, okay, a couple. Yeah, last time I asked uh, with some of the SWAT teams, some of these things are, are, are just not well known anymore. And there are stories out there. But it, Mueller started an orphanage that led to two, that led to ten, that raised somewhere in the, the 25 to $30 million without ever making a request for money, simply through prayer, raised money to support dozens of ministries and orphanages. And the most famous story is the one where he meets a little girl in the garden. He walks around because it's time for breakfast. And the table is set, the cups and, and the silverware is placed. But the cabinet door was open, and inside the cupboard door, there was nothing. There's no food. It's empty. And there's a couple little variations of the story. But Mueller says, children, you're about to see a miracle. Let's thank God for the food that he's going to, pro that he's going to provide for us. And there is no food. And I believe there were 27 kids in the orphanage at that time. And they prayed that God would provide breakfast. And they thanked him for a breakfast they could not see. And as they're praying, there's a knock on the door. And a baker gets up and they answer the door. The baker is there and said, hey, I got up early last night. I just couldn't sleep. And God told me uh, to bake some extra bread. And, and not only did they didn't get day-old bread or something expired and something that they were grateful for, they got bread right out of the oven. And as they were unloading the bread, there was another knock on the door, and the guy, the milk guy, the milk guy in the old cart with the horse said, my wheel just fell off my cart. I have all this milk. It's going to spoil. Could you guys use some fresh milk? Fresh milk. At a time when they had nothing, he prayed a prayer of faith that God will meet my needs. That's an amazing story, an answer to prayer. 
Hudson Taylor, my first week of Bible school, we had to read Hudson Taylor's Spiritual Secret, one of the first missionaries to China. As he was on the old sailboat and he had rounded Africa and he was coming up by the islands that were known to have cannibals, the wind stopped. There's no motorboats. There's no men downstairs with the oars. It, it, they're just dead in the water. And it's drifting closer and closer to the island where they're known as cannibals. Different variations of the story, but one is they got the big pot and the fire's already going. The cannibals are just waiting. Just waiting. This is like meals on wheels. Right? It's, like, it's coming right to us. And they go down to Hudson Taylor, the captain, and says, you're a man of God. You're a man of faith. Pray for wind. Pray that God sends wind. They're literally 100 yards from the beach. And Hudson said, I'll pray for wind if you put up the sails. Hmm. The guy said, well, no, once the sail, once the wind comes, we'll put it. It's a lot of work to but we're not going to. And the guy said, hey, I'm not, I'm not going to pray. I'm not going to pray until you put up the sails. You want me to pray for wind. You act in faith that God is going to work. And, and they did. They began to put up the sails. And Hudson Taylor went down into his cabin and they began to pray. About an hour later, the captain came down, pounded on the door and said, stop praying, stop praying. Our sails are ripping. <laughs> they're zipping across the water. They're ready to go water skiing. The boat's going so fast. Simple, direct answer to prayer in a time of need. There's one that Snoops, Snoops says isn't true. There's actually many variations. I think they couldn't verify it because it happened so many times. Uh, oh, do we have, yeah, and that's the, the story right here, where the missionary is in his tent, and there's a, whether it's the guy that had the medicine or the guy that was on the road or a missionary waiting, but the enemy, the tribe, had come, and the witch doctor and the chief, they're ready to kill this missionary. They don't like the message that he's given. There's a spiritual battle going on. And the next morning, the guy gets up, goes about his business, and, and a few weeks later, the chief of the tribe gets saved. And he said, I, I got to know who this God is. I got to know who this God is because we were ready to kill you. We had our pores and dots ready. We had our, we're, we're all set up, but we couldn't get to you because there were, I think it was 11 armed guards around your tent with flaming swords. What? What were you talking about? And when he wrote this story to the supporting church, that day the pastor had called a meeting and just felt a burden to pray. And he said 11 people showed up and they prayed protection over this missionary. Is there always a one-to-one -one correspondent, an angel per prayer? I don't know. I don't know. But that kind of story is seen over and over again. And when I first came here, when it was Garden City Chapel, we got letters from missionaries all the time, and I love to hear modern stories of God answering prayer. And uh, it's one of my favorites because it brings out a different point. <laughs> and, uh, and this deals with China, communist China. And they were being overrun. The village was destroyed. The orphanage where this missionary was was torn down, burnt apart. They beat up the director. They even went over and stomped on his eyeglasses. And he had serious eye issues, so he had really thick glasses. And he said, I, couldn't, I simply couldn't work after that. And I had terrible headaches, and I couldn't see, and we're trying to rebuild. And he said, all of a sudden, you know, weeks of struggling, we prayed, and these crates showed up from your church. They found out a year later when the missionary went on furlough, he comes to the church and said, yeah, I just want to thank you. I want to thank you for your supplies. And I, I, How did you even know? How did you know I needed glasses? Because when we got these three crates, we opened it up, and the first thing we saw on the top was a pair of glasses that had the exact prescription that I needed. And then the guy in the back said, I was building crates, and, and I, yeah, we, we had a good day, and the men were working, and it was going fine, and I went home, and I reached to get my glasses, and they weren't in my pocket. <laughs> what in the world did I do with my glasses? And they were a very special prescription that cost extra. And he said, I, I can't believe I lost these glasses. But somehow, in nailing the crates, they fell out of his pocket weeks before the missionary was attacked and his glasses were broke. God had an answer on the way before the need was even there. That's a sovereign God. But it also involved obedience, the sovereignty of God, and prayer. All those things work together. So hopefully those kind of stories inspire you. So we're going to look today just very specifically at prayer multipliers. You know, that principle in Scripture is so important. If one puts a thousand to flight, two puts... 
10,000. It multiplies when we pray together, where two or three are gathered in his name. We quote that verse all the time, but there is principles of praying. And one of the reasons I'm so excited about the days that we live in, despite what's going on politically, what's going on economically, what's going on with Twitter and Thread and all the stuff and Deep State and all the different whistleblowers and all the political stuff, is that the prayer movement in the last four years has just exploded. Right now, this weekend, Sean Fuchs, that young guy I met at a, a prayer thing, he's up in, a, he's going to all 50 states praying at the capital of all 50 states. And the last three states he went to was following a major flood or a disaster. And they're coming with all the support of like Samaritan's Purse and others, and they're ministering to people who lost their homes in floods. They're dealing with other stuff. They're, they're confessing of sins. They're leading these weekend worship times. They were in Times Square, New York. They had like 60,000 people on the streets of Times Square, New York, praising God and pray. Ah, oh, just amazing stuff. And then there's a group that's going around, I forget, uh, painting the states. They're actually driving around each and every 50 state and anointing the, the corners or the boundaries of every state, praying that God would bless and reminding them of our founding fathers and praying. It's just it's amazing stuff. So, simple, basic teaching. But if you're not seeing answers to your prayer, let's go back to some basics. Number one, are you praying the word? Are you praying the word? And uh, Matthew 4 is the greatest example. When Jesus was in the desert and he was being tempted and he had fasted for 40 days, which I still can't even fathom. <laughs> 40 days. If I go more than 24 hours, I can smell a potato chip a mile away. I'm tired. It just seems to float your way. But how did Jesus rebuke the devil? Three times. You know the answer. It is written. He prayed. He spoke the word of God. It is the sword of the spirit. It is our only offensive weapon is prayer. And he prayed the word. Simply knowing the word and praying the word. One of the prayers of the Bible are, are so important. My favorite prayer in the Bible, there's, well, there's a lot of them. There's a funny one. There, the funniest prayer in the Bible is when Peter was in prison. And the people gathered in a house that were praying that God would set them free. And there's an earthquake and an angel comes and the chains are born. And he gets out and he shows up at the house where they're having a prayer meeting, praying that he would be released. And when they open the door, he's like, leave us alone. We're praying for Peter to get out of jail. But I'm here. <laughs> and they go, wait, wait. And, and then he goes and tells the people, hey, I think Peter's at the door. And he says, well, maybe it's his ghost. Where's their faith? Can't be Peter. Can't be Peter. He's in prison. Well, you're praying that he gets out. <laughs> and he does that. But I, I love this. And Hezekiah and Jehoshaphat, two very similar prayers where they're surrounded, where they're cut off, where their supplies are down, where they have no hope of victory. And the three-part prayer in 2 Chronicles 20. First, he says, are you not? He reminds himself who God is. Are you not the God who created all things? Are you not the God who parted the Red Sea? Are you not the God who did this, this, and this? Begin your prayer to build your faith and remind yourself of the greatness of God. And then he said, Lord, did you not? Who are you? What did you do? Are you not the God of all creation? Are you not the God of the covenant? Did you not do something similar? Whenever someone asks me for prayer, I always try to think of a biblical example or a historical example where God met a similar need. And that gives me faith to pray for that person in another way. Are you not? Did you not? And then at the very end, when he finally gets that right, he says, now, Lord, will you not do something for us? Because of who you are, because of what you've done, here's our situation. Will you not? You know, we're helpless before our enemies, but our eyes are on you. That's a great pattern for prayer for nations and helpless situations to remind yourself what God is doing. So there's a couple simple things that I'm praying the principles of God's word. That's, that's just being in the word regularly and obedience at but I love this. I've got the red line through there. But praying the prayers. Pray, you know there's 650 prayers in the Bible? 650. There's 450 recorded answers to prayer in the Bible. There's 25 times Jesus is mentioned praying. And not that Paul was better than Jesus, but Paul mentions prayer 40 times. And if you ever want to know what to pray for for your church or for yourself individually, read some of those epistles of Paul and pray the prayers of Paul. I pray that you would walk in a manner worthy of your calling. I pray that you would be filled with the Spirit and the power of God. I pray that you would know the high calling that you have. I pray that you would comprehend with all the saints the height, the depth, and breadth of his love. 
There are so many great prayers that Paul, man, you can pray those right back to him. And that's for me. I pray that for my church. So, so we go from praying just basically. First, just praying God's word is powerful. When you pray the prayers that other people have prayed, that's even more powerful. And when you pray a promise of God that is yes and amen and a promise that cannot fail, that is even more powerful because God has promised certain things and you've got to know the promises of God. There are over 6,000 of them in Scripture. Um, I've got so many examples. i I got resources. In fact, if you want stuff on prayer, i got a bunch of copies of this. Kneeling, we triumph. Stories, quotes, like I'm just sharing with you now on prayer. Then examples, volume one, of how they prayed. People and missionaries around the world, just short. This is written like 50, 80 years ago. But it's got great stories of answers to prayer. So I got a couple copies of those. They're in there. There's, and uh, what's my, the, the book I just got, I got so many books on prayer. But this one by Wanda Alger just came out. And it takes, I think, 500 different verses and promises in God's Word. And it gives you the verse, and then it turns the verse into a prayer. And it's categorized from worry to provision to healing for marriage. And I just said prayer for your husband. That's an interesting one. What does that say? Why is that underlined, Dawn? Just pray for your husband. Pray for more. Drink. There are some great subjects in there. and uh, So there are some great resources. So. That's step one. Step one, to, just to make your prayer, take it up a notch. You know, boom, emerald, here we go. Say so of cooking, prayer, and pasta. Not. I couldn't think of a P word for fasting, so I, I went back. But, you know, there is a verse in Scripture that says, when you fast, when you fast, not if, but when you fast. It was a regular part of almost every revival leader. They would take a day a week, a meal a week, a week, a month, a week, whatever. A regular pattern of prayer and fasting, which is not a diet. It's not just giving up food or TV or any other physical activity, which is important. But uh, Tony Evans describes fasting as giving up an important spiritual, a physical need for a more important spiritual need. Let me say that again so I said it right. It's giving up an important physical need for a more important spiritual need. And it's not just, oh, I'm just going to skip lunch today. I get bonus points in heaven. It's going to add power to my prayer. It's taking that half hour where you would be stuffing your face and getting aside, listening to worship, setting and being focused on God. And it's amazing the principles of prayer and how the power of God. And it's in Scripture many times. Uh, there's a verse that's a, a, one of those that has a little italicized print in some of the newer Bibles when the disciples were trying to cast out demons and had no success. And then Jesus comes up and they said, Lord, why, why, couldn't, why couldn't we kick out the demons? We've done it before. You've given us authority. We know we have power over the devil. Why is this one not coming out? And he said, this kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. Now, some of the new Bibles have a little asterisk. This verse not found in some original manuscripts. So you're going to base your whole life on that. Somehow it made it in the Bible. Where did that teaching come from? If it was the only verse on fasting in Scripture, we would be in a tough pickle. But the fact that there's so many other principles about fasting individually and the power that it adds to prayer and the humility that's involved. And Second Chronicles, Esther, I mean, Esther, right? There, there, there are days from extermination. As a nation, the king had made a decree. It could not be changed. And she was born for such a time as this. But what did she do? She called the nation to pray and fast. Ezra 8 this morning, read Ezra 8, that's what I read this morning. Ezra 8, he called the nation to pray and fast. Chronicles 20 verse 3, when they were surrounded to prayer, we just quoted by Hezekiah, he called the nation to pray and fast. And if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, fasting involves humility and pray. There's a principle in prayer that makes it more powerful. And here's one that we don't do a lot in America. Persistent, we, we just don't pray. The, the phrase a couple of years ago was push, pray until something happens. But there, there's principles where you got to keep praying until you get the answer. And it's not, and this is an important distinction, I'm learning this now, prayer is not changing God's mind about anything. You don't have to reach in somehow, like we did with our parents when they said you're grounded, you can't go to the party or you're not allowed to go to the game. And we would wear them down and wear them down and wear them down eventually, all right, just go. That's, that's not what you have to do to your Heavenly Father. He's a good Father. And he knows how to give good gifts. 
But there's a principle of prevailing prayer. In Daniel chapter 9, it says when the 70 years were completed and the words of Jeremiah were fulfilled, Daniel knew it was time to pray that the captives would go home. But he had to pray. And he had to pray and he prayed, was it 17 days, Dawn? But you looked that up this morning. How many? 21 days? 21 days where there was a spiritual battle where the prince of Persia resisted and there was a spiritual battle going on. But he had to pray and continue through those days in order to get the answer. Elijah, one of my favorite stories, I, I, we've done it here a lot. You, you remember the story? You know, he declared that it wasn't going to rain for three years. And when the three years are completed and God came and showed up and said, all right, now it's time to go to the prophets of Baal. It's time to confront Ahab. And, and they had that big showdown. And then he said, now it's going to rain. God told Elijah it's going to rain. And Elijah knelt down to pray. And he says to a servant, do you see anything? No. And he prays seven times before he sees a cloud. Persistent prayer, knowing what God has promised. We're going to stand on that promise. We're not going to give up until we see the answer. And I just read a book called uh, Intercessory Prayer by Dutch Sheets. And he does a whole word on the word P-A-G-A, P-A-G-A, and others. And it's a wrestling. And if you look in the text, I never saw it. Yeah, you, love, you see new stuff in the text. Elijah says when he prayed, he put his head between his knees. That's, that's a little odd. There's seven different positions for prayer in the Bible, and it doesn't cover them all. Because you can pray standing, you can pray kneeling, you can pray prostrate, you can pray while you're walking, you can pray while you're driving, although that's not in the Bible. The joke, of course, is don't close your eyes. <laughs> Do you have to have your eyes closed? Do you have to speak out loud, or can you think your prayer? Is there more power if you speak out your prayer? I think there is. I think there is. We can you know, explore that a little bit later. But the key, as Dutch Sheets worked through the text, he said, the position Elijah was in was the position that women took when they had childbirth. I don't know how they gave birth in those days or what that position was like, but he compared the position of a labor and an agonizing and an effort. Prayer is work. And even though God had already promised it, Elijah had to pray it into existence. That, that's a mystery with the sovereignty of God and the free will of man. God has done his part. He has said his word, and it's going to happen, but somehow we need to pray. And, and it's more than just, all right, Lord, let it rain. It's, it's being so submitted to God, so filled with the Spirit, so under the control of God, that whatever the Spirit of God is praying, and when the Spirit of God prays for us, how is he doing it? What, what does the Bible say? With what? With groanings. When's the last time you groaned in prayer? When's the last time you wept in prayer? I'm telling you, at Stony Bank, we did around-the-clock prayer meetings once a year. We, we prayed through the night. And God bless Aunt Pat, she's in glory now. But boy, when she got to pray and then she started praying for the lost, she groaned. She wailed over the lost in her family. She pled with God for people who didn't know Jesus. I, I got to confess, I'm more like Keith Green. My eyes are dry and my heart is cold. I can give God my checklist. Lord, here's things I want. Here's things I'm doing. But to be so close to God, so aware of his heart, his passion, his purpose, that his heart becomes mine. That's another prayer God always says yes to Lord, help me love what you love and who you love. Help me hate what you hate. Help me to stand. That's a prayer that will change your life. So these are prayers that take persistent prayer. All right, we're going to wrap up. So, so again, I just mentioned Aunt Pat and being together. Our Thursday night group, uh, you know, our four or five regulars that are on our, our Zoom call, we have established a relationship that's gone to a different level. And, and our prayers, uh, we're, we're seeing answers all the time. Yeah. I'll give a quick testimony because you don't even know this yet. But on Thursday, I was complaining. I was complaining. The floor I was trying to put down didn't work. And it, it, it was costing me time. It was costing me money. It was costing me skin on my knuckles. And, and there are times when you wish there were Christian curse words. That's all I'm saying. I was very frustrated, mostly about the money. Oh, did I mention I had also gone to the dentist last week for a toothache? And they said, I probably need a, a root canal. Oh, and it's not covered by your insurance. I said, well, that's no problem because I have no insurance. You know, my dental plan is chew on the other side. That's my dental plan. <laughs> and, oh, in, in the meantime, uh, our vacation, which is coming up in three weeks, where we have stayed for free for the last 43 years with Pastor Ron Bretherick and his wife Sue. We love their house. We love their family. Ron uh, went to be with the Lord the last year because of COVID, and uh, Sue has offered us her house. And then she called this week and said, uh, I'm sorry, but my family's coming in that week. I know we promised it to you, but... I can't say no to my family, so you have no place to stay. 
You know what a root canal costs? You know what flooring costs? You know what a hotel at the beach for a week costs or a renting a house? And it was ding, 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 ding. And we prayed and I was venting to my brothers because you can do that when you bear one another's burdens. And they prayed for me. Now I didn't get to tell or get the answer. It's coming out tomorrow. But I got a booking the next day. Oh, and I got word from the Red Letter Awards that the voting has started for the Comedian of the Year, of which I'm a nominee. And I got a text from a comedian I never heard of, I thought it was a gimmick, and said, congratulations, your dry bar special was released today. Amen. All right. oh, well, they released a trailer, and with a coming out this week, three incredible answers to prayer, when I was like, Lord, there's money, oh man, it's empty, Lord, it's amazing stuff. But we are praying with people of like faith, of like mind, who love each other. We can join, and I've mentioned it already, we can pray the prayers of the Bible. We can pray the prayers of the Reformers. I have a book here, The Prayers of the Reformers. We can, the Book of Common Prayer. There are prayers that you can read that others have written, but if you pray it with passion and faith, they make a difference. And of course, the pneuma is another word for the Holy Spirit, to pray in the Spirit. Andrew Murray's book, Secrets of Intercession, his number one thing is regular, regular prayer at the same place at the same time just to build the habit. But once you get in that prayer, whatever it is, whatever time you pray, is just to be silent. Oh, I hate that. Just be silent until you are conscious of God's presence. That's like one of the greatest multipliers ever because I just go to God. Hey, you busy? God, I got a quick request. Can you take care of this? Take care of that? Not to settle my mind and heart and worship God and praise Him until I'm aware of His presence and then to lift that prayer up before the Lord. So praying with other people is huge. Whether every Tuesday with my Promise Keeper prayer meeting, 50 pastors in 50 states, to get with Intercessors of America where there's hundreds of thousands that are committed to praying every day for our country, to this redigging the Wells prayer movement, to the Sean Ford show. There's, there's prayer movements out there that are praying specifically for revival in the church. And I want to be joining with them because it fuels my fire and my passion. And then the last thing that just comes from the model of Jesus you want to study the prayers of the Bible? Why not the prayers of Jesus? Not a lot of written prayers. Of course, we know the Lord's Prayer. We may end with that. I was thinking of ending with that. The Lord's Prayer. The Disciples' Prayer. But the high priestly prayer of John 17, one that Jesus did at the Last Supper, knowing that in 24 hours he was going to the cross, look at what he prayed for. There's some pretty impressive things. Unity in the church was one. That God would be glorified in him and through what it was about to happen. His, God's glory was his greatest priority. That's, that, I mean, mostly it's for my convenience. Uh, remember, you remember the Jabez prayer? Remember the Jabez prayer? Uh, here's what it says in the book. Do you want to be extravagantly blessed by God? Read this book. Where's the focus on that? I want to be extravagantly blessed. I want a bigger car, a nicer house. I want my hair to stop turning gray. I want my kids to, you know, there's good things and there's silly things. But what does it mean to be blessed by God? Do you want to be blessed by God? That's a mindset that's wrong in the church. Not How can I be a blessing to God? And the priority is just wrong. And, and we see it in John 17 where Jesus says, for your glory, Lord, I ask this for your glory. And through the people that you have given me, may they glorify your name. And it says in Ephesians, or we'll go to right to Matthew 26. Matthew 26 is when he's in the garden. Again, agonizing in prayer. The drops of blood pouring out his heart all alone because he didn't have his prayer partners. They kept falling asleep. And in that setting, what does he pray? He's honest with God. Father, take this cup from me. I quote this a lot because it's so powerful. Jesus prayed to his Father and said, Lord, take this cup from me, the cup of wrath the cup of judgment, going to the cross. He prayed that he wouldn't have to go to the cross. And then he said the most important word in Scripture, at least in prayer, nevertheless, one word in the King James, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. The priority of prayer, whatever you ask for. And there's things that we want and, and all the stuff that's going on in our life. And, and I always say, God, I have a, I have a preference. I have a preference. I, if I could give you a suggestion, I'd like you to do this, I'd like you to do that. Nevertheless, I submit to you. 
You do whatever it takes for your glory. I belong to you. And that principle and priority in prayer has made such a difference in my life. So, that's it. That's it. Five things that as you as you target. And I, I, I think back to, just to pinpoint, back to the BB gun story to kind of wrap up. Finney, once he went through the frustration at not seeing prayers answered, began to study prayer and, and add faith to prayers and do stuff. And then he hired, hired, he had two men on his ministry team. I don't know that they were even paid. Father Nash and Abel Clary. And whenever he was going to an area, he would send those men out a week or two ahead to go pray over that town. What would you pray? How do you pray? And he found, he wanted to find out who were the most influential people, who were the biggest God-haters in that city. And he began to pray for key leaders to come to know Jesus. And then he began to identify strongholds over a city. What are they known for? Their pride, their stubbornness, their business. What is there areas of sin that we need to pray against? And there was a strategy that these men would pray so that when Finney showed up, they said the atmosphere was charged with expectancy because God had prepared a way for the Spirit of God to move. And entire cities, factories shut down, cities coming to know Jesus. They're the kind of stories that are in the book, how they prayed and what they prayed. It's amazing. It's amazing. As we do these principles, that our prayers will have greater effect. How do you pray for the lost? How do you pray for the sick? I think these are critical teachings if we're going to experience the revival I believe has already started. So let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you that you hear us. May nothing in our hearts, in our lives, interfere with our prayers. We invite your spirit to lead us, to guide us, to empower us in prayer so that what we pray is what you want to fulfill your word, to bring you glory, to establish your kingdom, to build your church, to reveal your glory in greater ways. We pray for wisdom and strategy in breaking strongholds. We pray for those in our AA group. You are the spirit of addiction and the struggles that these men and women have come and so humbly call out to you, looking for answer and power outside themselves. Lord, reveal yourself to these men and women, and I pray for these young Cub Scouts and the Scouts that meet here, that when they come in here, there would be a tangible presence of God, that they would see the artwork, that they would be just aware of, of right and wrong. Your spirit would bring conviction and, and a sense of holiness that leaders would turn to you. Lord, I pray for this town and all the struggles that we have with racism and pride and education and the poor and the things over this Garden City, Wallingford, Parkside area. Lord, give us wisdom to break these strongholds in Jesus' name. Let your spirit come in like a flood. Set this church on fire, and may it just be a, a light to your glory. Teach us, teach us how to pray more effectively, Lord, that we might see the results that we're looking for. We pray it. We pray it for the glory of your Son, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.